Hi everyone, I'm Jim Feng from the University of Alberta. Today I'm glad to present our work, Batch Stationary Distribution Estimation. This is a joint work with Google Brain researchers, Bordai, Li Hongli, and Dale Sherman. Estimating stationary distribution for a Gertig Markov chain is crucial for many theoretical and practical problems. In this work, we focus on the batch setting, in which we only have access to a set of pre recorded transition data. It has a wide range of applications. For instance, a business manager may observe and record the change in queue length for a short period of time, maybe during different time of the day. Such recorded data could be helpful to estimate the queue length distribution, which can help the manager allocate resource for better service. Another application is solving stochastic differential equations from evolving data. It finds many applications in econometrics, biology, and physics. Additionally, our method can assist MCMC sampling. As most MCMC algorithms require running a sufficiently long chain only to acquire one sample, our method can utilize the transition data along the chain to acquire samples. Finally, one important application of stationary distribution estimation is of policy evaluation in reinforcement learning. Given a dense set collected by unknown behavior policy, how can we evaluate a different target policy's performance? All these are important fundamental problems in diverse fields. We will show that our method can be applied to all these scenarios. In this paper, we study stationary distribution estimation from batch data, where we only have access to a fixed transition data set. We propose revisional power method, or VPM for short, to solve this problem. We also prove its convergence in functional space. Finally, we then demonstrate its performance in the domains mentioned earlier. We first specify our setting and underlying assumptions. Our goal is to approximate the stationary distribution of a transition kernel T here. In the batch setting, the input only includes a set of transition data, where x is from a probe distribution P, and x prime is the next state of x after transition. Noticeably, the probe distribution P is unknown to the learning algorithm. Only samples are given. Because we only have batch data, our approach is to estimate a point-wise ratio function so that the stationary distribution mu can be approximated by the ratio tau and the sample from P. To ensure that this is a valid approach, we have the following assumptions. First, we assume that the transition operator has a unique stationary distribution. Second, we assume that the stationary distribution is absolutely continuous with respect to the probe distribution P. In other words, we assume that the ratio function is bounded. These are standard assumptions in the literature. Next, we will derive our method in details. We first observe that mu is the principal eigenfunction of t. Therefore, the classical power method should be able to find the stationary distribution by simple iterations. In the batch setting, we only have access to a sample from the probe distribution p. So we reformulate the power method in terms of the ratio tau and define the corresponding operator here. This seems promising, and we ide ideally we will have linear convergence rate. However, there are two challenges. First, in the batch setting, we do not have access to the operator T. Second, applying the operator requires intractable integration in general. To solve the above challenges, we exploit the variational form of the F divergence and solve an optimization 
such that the optimal solution coincides with the power iteration update. Detailed derivations can be found in our paper. In this optimization, the ratio function can be parameterized as a new network. The expectation can be approximated by our available transaction data. And the previous iterator is simply the previous new network model with frozen parameters. This is an approachable optimization. However, we need some more modifications for this method to be practical. The first consideration is about normalization. We know that when tau is a proper ratio, it must be normalized with respect to p. Our solution is to use regularized Lagrangian with regularization parameter lambda and dual variable v. This is a convex concave problem, and the dual variable is only a scalar, so it is easy to optimize. The next challenge is that when we approximate the operator using sample, we will introduce some error. The error will accumulate for the power iterations if it is not controlled properly. Our solution is to use the damped iteration and modify the update as follows. Intuitively, when we use a step size between 0 and 1, the error will be damped and controlled. Luckily, this damped update is easy to implement. We only need to change this term in the objective to be a mixture of two expectations. Then we have our final variational power method update. OK, um, then let's uh, talk about the next slides. And so in this slides, I will talk about the convergence of our algorithm. So, uh, for simplicity, we will talk about the convergence in terms of the uh, stationary distribution mu instead of the ratio tau, just to simplify notations. Here, the epsilon, uh, here is the error term introduced in each power iteration. And this is the convergence result. Um, uh, this, is simply, this is just a simplified version. And the full version of the statement and the, as well as the proof can be found in the paper. And here, it, this is essentially saying that uh, the VPM iteration converges in terms of the uh, uh, in the speed of uh, one over square root of t for a good t uh, like transition kernel t. And yeah, is there some typo here? Uh, so the last index is capital R, so it's not mu r r goes from one to t, but mu t t goes from one to r. At the end of the sentence. Oh, uh, okay. Um, no, uh, here R is just the index over all the previous uh, iterates. Okay. So it is uh, convergence in the average sense. And so, but but the error bound holds for the first iterate as well, or? Like... Well, that's that's where we have the expectation. So here is oh, just the, that's yeah. a random index or, or something like that. Yeah. So it's uh, like the. Expectation over the previous uh, like, uh, on the yeah. average. Okay. Yes. Sorry. Uh, yeah, makes sense. Uh, any more questions about this? Um, so what do what what did we assume for this result for tau hat? Oh, okay. So tau hat is replaced by tau plus epsilon, and then the the errors. Yeah. Uh, so the errors are the same in all the iterations, or they are different. Oh, it's a batch data, so it's all the same, I guess. Right. So but it's just. Really true, but it's not really true because tau is applied to this mu t, or mu t minus one. Uh, so the errors are going to depend on the iteration. Right? Can can you even write this? Like you can't really write this. Well, I would say then that would depends on like how you define the error, right? Yeah. So here, yeah, I agree. I agree. So wow. the, the error here is really a simplified uh, version of all the like cumulative 
errors you can have. Like if yeah. you, like, I, I agree. Like it, um, if you really want to analyze this um, precisely, then we, we have to decouple the error in terms of uh, different from different sources, like the stochasticity and the previous iterates. And yeah, I agree. And so this result is concerned with the update uh, in the second this like second line, right? Uh, okay. And do you have a result where epsilon is is this data dependent and mu dependent error? Um, we don't have that for now. Okay. Yeah. All right. Because it's so like. Yeah, like there is some multiplicative effect which which you might be worried about if but I guess you can make me bonded or something and it doesn't matter that much, maybe. Okay. Okay. So then let's continue then. So um now let's uh, talk about some experiments. Um because of time limits, I will you just uh can give you some results and additional results can be found in the paper. And here, in the first experiment, I will, sh I will show you how we can use our result to post-process uh, MCMC. So in this experiment, we pick some potentials in the literature, uh, the Gaussian, the funnel, the kidney, the bananas here. And the probe distribution is just a uniform distribution in the, in the space. And we, to get the batch data, we use one-step Hamiltonian Monte Carlo and transition one step and get the next day x prime. And that would be our fixed batch data set, and we cannot iterate with the operator anymore. And we compare our method to a model-based method, which learns the transition uh, operator explicitly. And here are the results. The second column here are the model-based base method. And we can see that um, the model-based methods quickly concentrate is the, the, the mass in the high probability region. And in, uh, in contrast, our method EPM can sample uh, more diverse and more accurate examples just using the batch data here. And because the probe distribution is uniform, we actually can visualize the ratio function tau, and it should is in some sense represent the stationary distribution. And these are the visualization we have. And we can see that it is indeed to, uh, similar to the potential functions. So sorry, so columns B and C are samples from the distribution that you estimated as right. the distribution? Right. And then tau is OK. Uh, and so what model class did you use? Uh, for tau, it's just a two. Uh, I think it's just a two-layer neural networks. It just like give you the ratio, and how? And about then you can do resample from the data. Uh huh. And how about learning the model? Uh, that's that's the VPM, right? We use the batch of data and then iterate to learn the ratio function. Okay. So we are given the batch data from the. Uh, batch data from the uh, Hamiltonian multi-channel transitions, and I then we learn the ratio. More parametric uh, sample-based uh, estimate of the transition model. Okay. Yeah, the second that's the second column to estimate the transition kernel, and I then see. you apply the transitions okay. and see it where it goes. I see. I see. Yeah. So this is just to say that we can assist MCMC by just. Even though the MCMC train is very short, you can learn something. And our second experiment maybe is more um, familiar with the audience is the, to apply this to of policy evaluation. Here we focus on the uh, behavior agnostic set of, of policy evaluation. Here uh, we assume that we are given a batch of uh, transition data, SAS prime with the reward R, and we do, do not know the behavior policy P. And we target the next day S prime is the target action A prime, and denote the S A as the S A with the uh, as the, uh, the pair X X, and our VPM estimate the ratio tau 
for this SA pair. And mu is the stationary distribution of the target policy pi. To evaluate the performance of this target policy, we use this uh, computer uh, ratio corrected expectation, expected reward. And that will be our uh, target policy value. So our evaluation is mean square error to the true target policy value, and lower is better here. Uh, we use the, for the discrete case, we use the modified testing environment from the literature. And compared to other methods, such as really important sampling, which suffers from the curse of horizon, uh, our power method do not suffer this because we directly estimate the station distribution. And we can see that it indeed performs better than existing methods for this domain. And we also applied our method to some challenging uh, continuous domains, such as Risha, Hapchita, and Ant. And we can also see that it works better compared to other methods as well. And here, it, it, we, can, we show that it works for different number of trajectories and trajectory lengths and different behavior policies. And because of time, I guess I'm close to the end, and I don't have time much time to talk about the Appalachian state values. Essentially, this is talking about what happens if you use different learning rates and how many how, uh, how many optimization steps per power iteration and what regularization you are using for the uh, dual variable. And you can see that it still converges like for a wide range of cho uh, chosen parameters. And with that, that's, I will conclude my talk. Uh, and in this work, I we proposed a uh, variation of methods that estimates stationary distribution from batch data. It exploits the icon property of the transition operator and uses flexible parameterization such as neural networks. We prove the convergence of VPM and demonstrates its performance for various applications. So with that, I will conclude my talk and thank you for listening. I, can I start? Sure. I question, comment. Um, yeah, so people keep repeating this, that density estimation is hard in high dimensional spaces, by which they mean that sample complexity can be really high unless you have some a priori good understanding of how the density could look like. So given this, like how good it is to, uh, to try to do this for the sake of, of policy evaluation, like why should this work, uh, right? So one must be wondering about like if density estimation was was hard, even if you had samples from a density, then like how could it ever work? If you don't even have that, you only have samples from a transition car whose stationary distribution you want to estimate. It seems even harder. Yeah, that's that's yeah. I, I agree. That's that's um, that's hard. And well, we have some empirical results. And essentially, in order for this method to work, we have some assumptions, as I mentioned earlier. And I think those are some key key assumptions. And indeed, like I would say, like we don't have like the sample complexity, like results here, like how how much sample you actually need. But yeah, I, I agree. That's hard. Um, and I don't have a definite answer, like how we can, like um, using the transition data, is it easier, harder? I don't know. Yeah. I'm, I'm more like curious about like, are there some edge cases where it's clear that this approach should work well? Uh, I have a comment on that, which I really like the fact that you use MCMC. Uh, like a, it's a very good illustrative example to see where this works. And we know that your method is kind of repeatedly ap applying the one step, like the Bellman whatever type operator, right? And we know that that converges quickly when the when the Markov chain is fast mixing, and mm -hmm. that is exactly when the MCMC method also sort of converges quickly, right, to the stationary distribution. Um, so it's sort of the contraction property that is driving the convergence rate of your algorithm is exactly the mixing time of the Markov chain that is being used to generate um, 
the samples, something like that, right? Um, right. Like so. So one thing for the MCMC is that, like, because if we use MCMC, you you essentially don't know like when, like how long you need to run the chain. You don't know yeah. when you will mix, right? Right. But like here, we under the assumptions, like we know that like if it is like in some sense reasonable transitions, then we guys may even with short trains. Right. Yeah, I'm just wondering if the if the convergence rate of your algorithm is basically the same as the convergence rate of the MCMC algorithm would have been that you're using to generate the data. And of course, it's not quite the same because you are working with batch data, so you only get like one data sample, et cetera. But I was wondering if that sort of plays to the fundamental hardness of both of these problems. Um, thank yeah, you. That, that's, a, that's a good comment. Thank you, Roshan. Yeah, I think, I think that's, that makes sense, yeah. By the way, nice work. Thank you, Shaba. Uh, are you going to post the paper to Slack? Uh, it is. Uh, we have uh, uh, we have an earlier version and archive version is already there. So yeah, yeah. So maybe with more results and some some more arguments and uh, analysis. So if you are interested, you can always look at the paper. I can ask more questions. Sure. Uh, so for policy evaluation, uh, I think it's OK to estimate the mean reward or mean return or the expected return. But you probably want to have some estimates of like the range that this mean would lie in, right? Like some interval estimate. I see. Okay. If you want to select between policies, then like you at the end of the day, you need some intervals, right? Like you want right. to know like how sure you can be uh, about your estimate. Yeah. Okay. So that in that sense, you are talking about maybe some confidence estimation, like some of the estimate, like the rewards and maybe some other quantities. I would say like because right now we focus on the uh, the reward which is just one particular quantity of the stationary distribution right so we can talk about some other quantities that are related to the stationary distribution so that's an interesting direction and we should try that yeah so stationary distribution is a very like a rich uh, representation so there are many quantities that can be related to this uh, distribution So other comments, questions? I do have a question. Okay. Did you talk to Bo when he was here? Bo Dai? Sorry? Did you talk to Bo or, or is Bo part of this paper? Yeah, uh, yeah, it is right here. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. All right, okay. That's how I know about this paper. Okay, I see. All right. He keeps talking about this par method. He likes it. <laughs> Yeah, I like this here too. Yeah. It's kind of curious. It's like the dual of the value iteration kind of things. Yeah. It's pretty clever that you're doing this uh, um, smoother updates. That's nice. Yeah, that's actually that's important. Otherwise, it's, it may not work.
All right. right. If there are no more questions, let's all thank the speaker. Thank you. OK. Thanks. I have like one sort of speculative question that, um, like, what are the possibilities that you see for applying this to sort of RL, MDPs, policy evaluation, all that sort of thing? Um, well, um, it, as I said, like, uh, like it really just to estimate the state distribution, you can use that for all sorts of things. Here, I don't know, like, uh, I guess other than just evaluation, you can do other things. This is back to the station diffusion. I'm not sure, but that's possible to do both. Just say. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like when you have the station distribution, you can maybe do whatever application you want, like to right. other than evaluation, maybe policy optimization or some other things. Right. I was I was reading this old paper with by Dale and Mike Bowling and a few other people where they were proposing sort of like well like policy opt you know, planning, right? So finding optimal policies, but mm -hmm. also finding the stationary distribution steps with policy improvement. And policy improvement is just sort of maximize, like, you know, finding the greedy policy, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so this paper is from, I don't know, 2007 or eight or something like that. Um, and so, uh, yeah, and so they didn't really have a lot of convergence rates and so on, but I was wondering if the extra work that you have done makes it possible to implement that efficiently. Right. So you can do just like you do value iteration, but you do it in completely in policy space or in stationary distribution space. Right. So, yeah. um, and since I saw Dale's name here, I thought there might be some connection to that. There's always this. Uh, I think you're, you're talking about the paper like uh, learning the, the policy in dual space, something like that. Uh, yeah, it's, I forget the title, but it's like dual dynamic. Yeah. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know the paper. That's yeah. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. All right. See you guys. Thanks. Bye.